So I would like to welcome uh, everyone. First of all, our two special guests, Mike Moravsky and Emily Pringle. Thank you for accepting our invitation to talk to us today. And all dear friends and colleagues who have joined us for this discussion. Um, I was thinking this morning and I smiled at the thought. Uh, I read in a book, but I don't remember which one, that somebody had arranged their bookcase, not according, not in alphabetical order, the authors or by subject, but according to which book was taking you to the next one. And I thought of it that this is how we're here today. <laughs> if you two were on my bookcase, you would be one next to the other. Uh, because it was the, when I was reading Mike's book, uh, Museums as Agents of Social Change, that I got to Emily's article, Art Practice, Learning and Love. Uh, and that's how I had the opportunity to find out a bit more about what uh, the work at uh, the Tate. Um, as we have explained to our participants, there will be a 30 to 40 minute discussion uh, to hear a bit more from our uh, guests and then we'll have a good 20 minutes in the end to talk with uh, with everyone so that you can raise your questions and make comments. Um, I think I will start by Mike asking the really central question of what if love was the core value that steered the radical change needed in museums today? Mike, what if? Awesome. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Maria, for inviting me to be a part of this um, and for your work um, in the field. Um, and then I'm just so thrilled to be uh, in this program with Emily, who has been a mentor and certainly been someone who's inspired a lot of the, the questions and the thinking that I've done in museums. Um, I've been able to visit um, Emily and, and the team over there at the Tate um, a couple times um, over the last many years and we were just reconnecting over the last time we were able to, to see each other in person before, not too far before the pandemic, um, which was nice and always wonderful to see colleagues. Um, and yeah, I, I, I think that question about like, what if, what if love was the driving force, you know, behind the work that we were doing in museums. And I think you can even kind of, you know, expand that and think about you know, things like care, compassion, relationships, you know, this sort of, this whole <clears throat> kind of galaxy of values and core human principles um, that make, that I think have the potential to make museums more human-centered places, um, which I think it goes in contrast to what I think most people still feel um, as they're working within museums or engaging with museums. And, um, and I say that, I, Recently, there was a workshop that I led on change and how we can go about advancing change as individuals, but also as institutions. And there was this kind of poignant moment in the workshop where um, we were talking about some of these deeper human values that we individually held. And people felt like they're, they weren't really able to bring those into their museum work. And someone said, museums just don't feel very human. Uh, and everyone just kind of, there was just silence and everyone just kind of like sighed <laughs> in you know, like in this collective sort of exasperation. Um, and, and but we didn't, we didn't end it there. You know, I think there's so much potential. There's so much um, opportunity for, you know, those of us working with museums or in museums to really crack this nut and really think about how we can become more connected with these deeper human values, whether they be love, you know, and I think, um, I think it is radical <laughs> within museums to think about these things, but if we think about other, you know, other fields, maybe even within, you know, health and medical professions, within the wellness profession, within social justice organizations, um, community organizing, even within schools, you know, I think, these things are easier to surface, um, this idea that we care about each other, that trust matters, that relationships matter, um, and that we can seek out, you know, spaces of justice uh, in the work that we do. Uh, they don't feel so radical in other areas, but within museums and the legacies and the histories that we're sort of rubbing up against, um, it is radical work. And I think it is um, really challenging to sort of make that 
make that change happen. So yeah, so it's something that I'm really interested in talking a lot about. And, and I appreciate Emily's perspective too, because um, it's one institution where, you know, they've really been thinking about that. And I appreciated her, you know, piece that was written um, in, in sort of being vulnerable about what that process is like when you think about these deeper values that are underneath kind of, they're underneath your mission, they're underneath your goals and objectives. Um, they're, they're really kind of, you know, deep and we don't often go into those deep sort of yeah. places. And we'll get back to that issue of uh, values. Uh, but first, perhaps we could um, uh, hear Emily a bit more. Your article dates from 2014. It refers to work. It refers to work undertaken in 2010. And I was thinking that for many of us, I don't know how many, but for many of us, our learnings from the pandemic have obliged us somehow to recenter our thinking and our practice on 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 love and on care. So it was a bit of a surprise for me to see that uh, it's not new, of course it's not new, but that some organization, some formal organization, a museum actually uh, um, uh, put love in, in practice. Uh, so um, would you like to talk to us a bit more about this, this process and how it changed your work at the Tate? Absolutely, and uh, just to echo, First of all, uh, what Mike said, and thank you so much for inviting me. It's an absolute uh, pleasure for me to be in conversation with both of you. Um, I mean, it, it, it came about this process through um, really quite a kind of pragmatic decision on the part of myself and two colleagues who were in the leadership team for the learning division at that time. And... Uh, early in uh, to 2010, 11, we'd gone through quite a radical restructure uh, in the division and everyone was quite unsettled and um, we felt it would be really important to, to go right back to basics, as you say, uh, Mike, to really kind of dig deep and to ask the kind of key question, which remains for me still the really key questions, which is, what are we doing and why are we doing it? And, and it's always the why question which interests me. And then um, from that, the how question emerges. And uh, it was through posing these questions that we recognised that in order to answer that the how question, how are we going to do the work? Once we'd kind of thought, well, we, we have some understanding of why we're doing it. We have a commitment to social justice. We, we believe in the museum as, as a, a space that should be uh, democratic. Uh, you know, we believe in, in access to art as a basic human right. These were, these were some of the issues that, that came up. But then um, the how are we going to do the work to enable us to achieve you know, or to, to be able to feel comfortable that we were we were doing the work for the right reasons. Um, it then became clear that we really needed to interrogate our values. And we did a series of, of workshops with the different teams that made up the learning team. So we have a team that works with schools, team that works with young people, um, an interpretation team, public programs. And uh, they were tasked with identifying what they felt as teams were their, were their core values. And um, each, each team came up with a series of, of, of really, you know, came down to sort of words. So trust came up very often, risk, generosity, openness. Um, our schools team have desire had desire, I, I believe they still do is one of their values, which I, I find really interesting and desire in that sense of a commitment to an ongoing process in those terms. And then it honestly came about that we met then the senior, the three of us as a senior management to do this exercise for ourselves. And when we were looking at all these terms and we'd been doing some reading and particularly I've been reading Bell Hooks and it just seemed to me that, that uh, when you brought these terms together, actually what you're talking about is love. And that all those different elements of it, generosity, trust, risk, are, re are, are really what you need if you're, if you're going to act and behave in a, in a loving way. And so 
so we kind of had this kind of light bulb moment where it was well isn't it isn't it all about love and then uh and then there was a oh oh we can't say that word you know that is that, that you know that feels really uncomfortable and and uh so so there was a kind of backing away from it and then uh a sense of okay well if we are going to use love we need to be able to really articulate clearly what this means to us and it was at that point that um i was pointed to the wonderful quote from paula Freire, and it just seemed to sum up for me uh that it really is fundamental that we and this is very much echoing what mike has just said that that if we are going to do our work with all with all the bring our whole selves to it we need to do it with love and 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 with you know under underneath that we need to do it um manifesting trust risk generosity openness um so it became really just a foundational set of principles and a way of kind of checking ourselves so so you know the question would then be if someone was coming with a programming idea it would be the 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 question to ask is well how does that manifest mm. how does that yeah. manifest our values uh and it became an incredibly useful kind of pragmatic tool actually to be able to identify whether we were working in the way that that we we said we were yeah so um, the values for me can do that really brilliantly yes um let me just uh, mention the quote from paulo freire for our uh colleagues who are here with us today uh, so Paulo Freire wrote, and Emily uh, quotes him in her article, we must dare in the full sense of the word to speak of love without the fear of being called ridiculous, mockish or unscientific, if not anti-scientific. We must dare in order to say scientifically and not as mere blah, 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 that we study, we learn, we teach, we know with our entire body. We do all these things with feeling, with emotion, with wishes, with fear, with doubts, with passion, and also with critical reasoning. However, we never study, learn, teach, or know with the last only. We must dare so as never to dichotomize cognition and emotion. Um, when uh, Mike was discussing values, and you did as well, Emily, uh, as I shared with you before, we had um, an ex this experience back in May with the Happy Museum project. We had a workshop on values, and one of the first um, uh, the first uh, uh, exercises we did was to um, choose three of uh, from a long list of values. Uh, three that were most important to us. And once we did that and we discussed it in groups and we went back and we were asked, so uh, who among you feels that these values can be practiced in your place of work, that you are working according to your values and that these values are respected? And I think only one person said, I can say that this actually happens. And it was probably because it was their own, they had set up their own thing. They were <laughs> totally responsible. So the majority of the people working for other organizations, they could, they could not actually say that, yes, my values are respected and I'm working according to them. So what does it take? What does it, um, well, Emily gave us an idea already um, that the management team became aware that this was an important, um, this was important for the team. And actually, whenever a proposal was coming, you would say, okay, how does this, this manifest our values? Because it is important not just to say them, but also to show it in practice. Do you see this happening in museums? Do you want me to answer or Mike? Whoever wishes to speak first. I can, I can say, um, you know, in all honesty, that they that, that what I'm talking about here applied to the learning division, and I think I can say really comfortably that um, I don't see there is a schism between the values that are held with the department and how they work. Where it becomes more challenging 
is how the values of the learning team can rub up against the other agendas that the museum is necessarily having to contend with. And I can see and, and witness, and I've done subsequently a piece of research looking at how museums generate knowledge. And it became so apparent to me that the museum is endlessly negotiating contesting agendas so there's about the, you know, there's the need to generate income, there's the need to look after and build your collection, there's the need to um, reach out to your audiences, and there's the need to be kind of academically, uh, seen to be academically very rigorous. And it's sometimes when, when people within the institution are having to negotiate those amongst other agendas, the values can get re really tricky to hang on to. Yeah, what do you think, Mike? How can, if let's say one department within a museum is clear about their values and how they wish to work, but it's not exactly uh, an institutional culture. It's not embraced by everyone. Yeah. How do you see this I, happening? Yeah, I think that's probably just really common experience. Um, and, I, and I do think that it isn't just at Tate where it's happening within the learning department or within an education team. I think for, you know, decades, uh, you know, even uh, generations, I think that the areas of education, <clears throat> and I think a lot of, you know, visitor, the visitor facing and audience uh, interacting areas of museums can be the place where these things um, live and, and bubble up and grow. And then there are, like Emily said, conflicting agendas. And I think that the change that, the radical change that needs to happen isn't just to allow this type of, you know, values, uh, exploration and, and um, sort of allowing programs to live the values, like not just saying, well, that can be in education or that can be through our programs or maybe that'll be through an exhibition. Those are all like sort of, they're really important things, but they're kind of surface things. But mm -hmm. when you get, those types of values at the deeper level of an institution, then you, you start engaging in radical practices like what if we budget according to these values? And I've seen institutions do values-based budgeting. And that's a powerful transformative practice that you know probably has a lot of, it's probably hard to do, but what if all the dollars that you had in your budget went to, were allocated based on the values that you had? You know, um, and then you come across, you know, some sort of budget area and you're like, well, I don't know how this aligns with our values. Oh, well, aha. <laughs> yeah. You know, and then, you know, what would it look like if love was the force that was driving, you know, fundraising and development practices, which can be really harmful in a lot of cases? Um, like, how would that change that? And, and then, of course, the big question is, you know, what would it look like if we curated and, you know, I mean, being being a curator is really based in this, right? You're, you're caring for, you know, predominantly other communities' things. Uh, you're not taking care of your own stuff, you're taking care of other people's things. And so it should be all based in building trust. It should be entirely based in building relationships yeah. with communities of origin, with knowledge holders that have, you know, extremely powerful connections to those objects and being able to figure out how we can, you know, kind of center that more. So there's, you know, and you, you could just go on and on. Every area of the museum, I think, can be radically transformed when you start to think about this. Um, and the, the only other thing that I kind of want to say on this area, because I think it's really important and sometimes we kind of skip past it, is like, why is this so hard? Why isn't this happening? It sounds beautiful, right? Ooh, let's all do this. Well, it's not, it's not easy to do because we're sort of often lacking an acknowledgement of, um, you know, kind of why this is shoved down, why this is so difficult, um, which is because it's not, val has not been traditionally valued within white dominant culture, within, you know, sort of European American centered cultures. Um, it hasn't been particularly valued within cultures that are defined by capitalism and colonialism, uh, patriarchy. And so I think that, um, you know, museums are doing some of the work, I think, to sort of acknowledge that and understand that. But like that's, you know, 
that I think is so key and it's interrelated to a lot of the equity work that's happening within institutions all over the place. It's just acknowledging, you know, how we create, how we even created the cultures that didn't value this stuff Mm -hmm. to begin Mm -hmm. with. And then let's get rid of that and replace as much of that and move on and transform as much of that as we can into a new culture. And that's really hard, but but I think it's, you know, it's just got to happen, you know, step by step. Mm -hmm. You brought up two issues that I would like to explore a bit further. First of all, you mentioned the word community. So is community a meaningless word? And that's a question for both of you. Uh, You write in your book, and that really shook me. Uh, It made me laugh at the beginning, and then it made me, it shook me. We've been trained to think of museums as separate from communities, hence the word outreach. I had never thought of this like this, actually. Yeah, this this is where we are, the museums, and then we outreach out there. It's the community and we're not part of it. Uh, So how can we define community? How do you define community within your work? And how can we move beyond performative statements? Well, I'm happy to jump in quickly, but then I, I really want to hear your thoughts, Emily, so on, because <laughs> I think this is something we're all, well, we, we probably talked about this the last time we had a conversation. Um, yeah, even just, gosh, I catch myself so often. I don't even work within a museum now, but you, you one can catch themselves saying we and they when we're referring to, you know, those that work within sort of a um, a museum and and people that are outside of that. And I think um, I was just even reading a text panel recently that was literally about museums are not neutral. And it was a museum making a statement on its wall. I can't remember the institution. It was on Instagram um, about how they were processing their own, you know, legacies, their own, they've created harm and they're trying to do better for others. And I even just cut myself caught up like, well, who is we? Hmm. And how, who's not part of that we? And that's a problem. And I think it was, so I think the language we use is really powerful. And I think it's defined, largely defined community as, I mean, Nina Simon sort of says um, that, you know, we define community as those people that aren't visiting our museum right now. (laughs) You know, and that's a big problem. That means it excludes so many people that are visiting our museum. It excludes those that work for the museum. When we were really, you know, mining these ideas of community when I was at the Portland Art Museum, it was so important to acknowledge that the sort of um, the problematics of that separation and that we had to connect with each of ourselves as a community member. And what, like, what communities are we a part of? And you know, and how are we not just reaching out to those people? Like, how do we understand the overlap between, you know, a museum's community and this broader public community? And so um, I'll sort of end by just saying how, like some of the thoughts I had about defining community um, that I think are important. And there's just four quick things that I think of. One is that that definition should always be evolving. There isn't a moment when you're going to decide this is the definition. Let's get it in writing and let's put it up on the wall or something because that's not going to happen. You should always be questioning it and changing it and allowing others to sort of influence it. The second thing I think is thinking about place. Um, Being at a smaller, more local museum, it's maybe easier to think about the impact your institution has on, you know, the, the sort of local place you're in, the region and who you're connecting with. But I think understanding those geographies are really important. Even if you're a really big museum, what is your impact on you know neighborhoods, your neighborhood, neighborhoods that have no connection with your institution? Um, third, I think um, any definition of community needs to address the inequities and the power imbalances you know that have created separation between the museum and groups that have been marginalized from that institution um, and continue to be so. So I think that's a really important part of it. And then last, you know, it's just like we've said, like we're talking about now, just making sure that you're rejecting the false separation between, you know, us museum and, you know, those community members, because it's so much more complicated than that. Thank you, Mike. Emily, your thoughts on how to Yeah, I mean, that's so helpful to hear you run through that, Mike, and and I couldn't agree more with everything that you say. I mean, I think the language gets even more problematic. Um, You know, there is this term harder to reach communities, uh, which 
you know, it's this assumption, presumption that the museum sits at the centre and everybody else is kind of out, you know, out there, but, but, and, and that everyone's, you know, the problem is they're not coming to us uh, rather than, well, what, what can we do to, to be relevant and engaging and interesting to folks who, who don't come and visit us? So I think that's one of the problematics about how community has been used uh, and instrumentalized. Uh, I mean, and I think it's one of the interesting uh, dangers that we need to, to think about in museums in our current context, because, um, you know, there is this, the, the, the pandemic has necessarily, I think, necessitated for museums to think about their, their local much more uh, acutely, because, you know, you, 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 it's certainly in the case of, for example, a, a museum like Tate Modern, which uh, historically has relied on a lot of international tourists. Well, they're not coming in the, in the same way they were before. Uh, so therefore, the museum kind of, you know, looks around and goes, oh, we need to think about our local community. And that's not to say that, you know, to be fair, very, you know, to good committee colleagues who've done work at Tate Modern for many years. But there is just this danger of suddenly we need you uh, mm -hmm. rather than what can we do for you. Uh, and, and I think it's all part of a broader shift that the museum needs to, uh, to use uh, technical like get over itself. You know, it really has to start thinking of itself not being, uh, uh, as you've put Mike, separated, uh, but, you know, at the centre. It needs to think about itself of being completely immersed, networked in, in a whole load of messy connections and, and that communities, plural, are all part of uh, this kind of ecosystem that the museum needs to sit within, ideally. Um, but I think we're quite used to being the node and, uh, you know, in the centre and, and drawing everyone into us on our terms. And that's again a huge shift, I think, for the institution to to, to come to terms with. Mm. Recently, you reminded me Emily, that recently in a, in a in a in another discussion we were having with colleagues here in Portugal, um, uh, one very dear colleague who's the artistic director of a small uh, performing arts festival taking place in uh, small in the sense it takes place in small areas, not not the big urban centres, told us that um, during the pandemic. Uh, she decided to call some of the people in those places that normally participate in the festival, help organize it, etc. And uh, just to see how they were doing. So she had um, a discussion with a lady. So how are you? How, uh, how are you handling this? And eventually when this conversation somehow ended, the lady asked, so what do you need from me? So she, she thought that the artistic director of the festival was calling her because she needed something from her and not just to see how she was. And this really was a very nice discussion for us because it really made us think all the beautiful and important points you're bringing up about our relationship to people and where we put ourselves, even if we don't say it, that's what we show, that's what we communicate and how people uh, see us. Um, I would like to uh, ask one more question to Mike, and then perhaps we could open up to our uh, to the rest of the participants. Mike, you were one of the founders of Museums Are Not Neutral uh, movement. Uh, have you seen any change since the movement was uh, launched? And especially, I would like to hear you on. Uh, the case of museums that actually have equity, uh, access, diversity and equity policies, and if this is actually more than just performative statements, how is this going? Yeah, I think that's <clears throat> such a great question. And I've been thinking about it, you know, like, have we made, have, has there been change? Um, I've been thinking about that a lot recently, and I kind of have a few different resp <laughs> responses to that, because I think it's a complicated thing. Um, one is kind of in the short, like thinking about change in the short term, like have we seen some some quicker change? Because I think uh, that 
in the in the bigger scheme of things, like in my work in museums, I tend I've tended to always to be someone who's a little impatient about change. Like I want to kind of see it happen now, and you know uh, I'm not willing to sort of allow these big bad barriers to get in the way. Although it's, it's hard, but <clears throat> in the short term, I think there you know just in the last couple of years, we've seen these conversations become you know about not just museum neutrality, but just about you know museum change and transformation and equity and you know I think um, you know really understanding um, some of the harm that's happening within within institutions and the need to change that and that may be around you know decolonizing collection practices um, you know really you know completely changing leadership in some cases um, and just interacting with visitors in very different ways and I think. Um, and I think, yeah, we've, so we've seen, uh, we've seen these conversations around museum change just really bubble up a lot more. And I think, you know, museums are not neutral, museum workers speak, um, museums on race. There's just so many different groups, certainly within the U.S. and beyond that have been, you know, mass action is one that's, you know, primarily U.S. based that's been, you know, pushing things forward. Um, and I know there are several, you know, in, in Europe and beyond that are helping push this conversation. So I think that's great. It's on social media, it's happening within departments, emerging staff and younger staff sometimes are the ones that are trying to really spark and catalyze these conversations around change. And that's been exciting to see. And people are connecting with each other in ways that I don't think they had been prior to, you know, creating these spaces online. And, and during the pandemic, then people, you know, kind of were motivated even more so to stay connected and utilize these networks. Um, we've seen, at least over here in the U.S., a real rise in uh, labor organizing and unionization within museums, which I think has been a really great uh, step in the right direction. So that's a big change that's been happening. You know, if, if leadership isn't going to make the changes to sort of treat workers with respect <clears throat> and, you know, pay people living wage and, you know, take the necessary safety precautions during, you know, a pandemic like we've been experiencing, um, it's been great to see workers unite and come together and they're, you know, just, you know, trying to bring things like care <laughs> into the workplace. Um, and in some cases, it's been a struggle. In some cases, you know, there have been museums where um, it sounds like that's been easier to do, where there's been support for, you know, everyone kind of getting together and, and doing that. Um, in the law, you know, then, but then I sort of step back and think there are deeper institutional and system-wide changes that aren't taking place. Um, and, I, and I hope that these are things that we'll see, you know, not within our lifetimes, you know, and, I, and I'm trying to be more okay with that pace of change, like that both have to be, we have to have, we have to hold both in the same space that there is change happening now, but that systemic change is, isn't something that I'm necessarily gonna see, but um, hope that the sparks that we're lighting now catch fire and continue to make change happen in much longer ways. <clears throat> um, but, but you mentioned equity policies and statements and, you know, to be completely honest, that stuff just kind of gives me an acidy taste in the back of my throat when I sort of read equity statements and policies out there from museums, because I just don't feel like they're coming from a real deep place of these values that we sort of talked about to, to reconnect it back with sort of the core of our conversation. Um, I do think they're largely performative. I do think they can be even harmful um, when museums are pushing these equity language out there, but yet you will read in the newspaper the next day how they're treating their staff and their curators and, you know, um, staff of color and indigenous staff and LGBTQ staff and uh, staff, you know, living with disabilities. <clears throat> so I think um, there's still a reality that that we need to address within museums that can't just be painted over with, you know, equity policies and statements. Um, so, so I'd like to see more, more real action <laughs> take place yeah. and not just language and statements and social media posts and black squares and things like that. And I think we would all, many of us would like to see some more real action, although we know that the big change, it's not going to be in our lifetime. <laughs> uh, um, a question for both of you, just to take this a bit further. Um, there are people working in museums who are seriously concerned with these issues and especially these small changes that need to take place so that we can move a bit uh, further into a more just system, uh, also within museums. 
um, if you if you were to outline the two three first steps to take in order to start you know delving into this what would you suggest to our colleagues to all of us where should we start from emily would you like to start oh that is a huge question but yeah but the small steps <laughs> yeah, that's a really good one i mean i do think that that um, exercise on on just interrogate, just asking those questions about what are you doing and why are you doing it, mm. is a is a is a re really helpful uh, exercise to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and then to um, think about, you know, what you know, do the exercise about what are the values that m mean the most. If you, if you know, I'm I'm sure a lot of these great colleagues who are present here have probably done all this already. But uh, I think it's always helpful uh, to to just spend time, and if you have done it, go back again and again and again to keep revisiting and saying, well, are we are we doing what we say we're doing? Um, the other thing I think is really helpful is to come together and have a conversation as honestly as possible around what are the barriers. And so um, not just, you know, uh, is barriers almost on a macro scale. So being really honest about what situation your institution is in and what is feasible and possible. Because I think, uh, I think it, it's, people are frustrated, they want change, but I think also people can burn out really quickly at the moment because uh, they're doing really brilliant work, pushing really hard for change. Um, and institutions, as we've just said, are slow and cumbersome and quite change resistant. So I think it's somehow tempering the desire for change with a, with a realistic look at what is possible? What is the priority? What can we do as a small change? Is it, you know, I think one of the most significant changes that we've made at Tate is really thinking about our recruitment policies mm. and looking at how we describe our job, descri our, our job descriptions. And they're quite, you know, these are quite kind of prosaic, you know, they're not as glamorous as putting out an equity statement, uh, but actually, I think in terms of the impact it's had on who works in the institution, it's far more profound that, that we, we, we've thought quite carefully about where we recruit from, what, what um, qualifications we look for, how we describe our jobs, you know, just kind of, it's almost like the, it's looking at the little details as well as the big kind of, we want to change the world stuff. Um, you know, that's it's, very it's not as glamorous. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you, Emily. Mike, what first three steps would you recommend? Um, yeah, so first, first, they're just these are just fun little things, but I think they change our mindset. One is we've got to change our language uh, of yes, but to yes, and like catch yourself when you're at a meeting or you maybe you're even listening to this presentation and you're thinking, <laughs> yeah, but like. Just, just catch yourself and pause and, and think about where that's coming from and then just shift it to like, yes, I hear what you're saying and I have a question or and I have an idea to add on to that. Um, that's a powerful strategy. Um, second, I think um, this connects with what Emily said. I think we need to change the stories we tell ourselves about our work and our institutions. And so often we get stuck in the I can't stories. You know, like if we're, um, you know, we just, we're just a cog in the wheel. We're, you know, a mid-level staff person at a museum. We're always telling ourselves that sounds good, but I can't because, and we just need to start. You can literally write down, I can blank because blank and start <laughs> to change those stories to more radically positive things. Um, and then last thing is just, this is actually really challenging, but it sounds so easy. Be the change that you want to see in the work that you're doing. So like when you get to the end of a week and you're angry about this, or you want this to change, or you wish other people were doing this, what about you? Have you been doing that? 
you know, have you been practicing those things? Have you been treating maybe direct reports to you in a different way? Have you been thinking about these values? Like, so I think sometimes we're, you know, what pointing one finger out, but really <laughs> we've got to be focusing in on how we are part of what we need to be changing about the work that we're doing. Great, thank you. And I hope the rest of the colleagues who are here with us today are actually thinking at this moment, yes, I can do this. <laughs> Great, thank you both so much. Uh, let's open up now to the rest of our colleagues. Please turn your cameras on if you feel like doing that. And uh, also uh, please raise your hand or let me know in the chat if you wish to share some thoughts or ask a question. You're most welcome. Who would like to go first? Who's feeling empowered? Say, yes, I can. <laughs> yeah. If there's not an immediate question, perhaps, I don't know, I could ask another, I could go back to Mike's book where he shared with us that um, what he sees in museums is the potential to tell new and diverse stories, amplify marginalized voices, celebrate unheard stories, and recognize the creativity, knowledge, expertise, and lived experience that is already thriving within their local community. And perhaps this is a question for everyone. How, how are we doing this? Are we actually aware of all this wealth of knowledge and experience uh, that we have around us and um, are we making connections to our work in our museums? We're very silent today. <laughs> Then perhaps I would go back to okay. Mike. May, may I say yes. something? Eric, please, yes. Well, well, thank you very much for, uh, for your, what you've said. Um, I just feel right now that, uh, you know, the, I mean, I, the topics are a bit too big to, to actually to, I cannot make you a precise question because I think, I think the things are so, so big in a way that it's very hard to, to pinpoint to something. That's all I want to say, yeah. I've got kind of a uh, thank you for that. I appreciate that. And I think um, one thing I'm kind of curious about to hear from maybe a few of you is uh, Maria brought this up earlier kind of about um, this disconnect that we have or this gap between the sort of values that we hold dear or maybe what we feel matters most to us. And then maybe we're not seeing that like connect with an institution that we're working for. So there's this gap between sort of like how we want to really be our whole selves and our truest self. But then when we get into our, you know, professional sort of work, all of a sudden we kind of might have to feel like that has to be secondary. Um, are, are people feeling that? Or do you feel like there's a real connection between kind of the passions and the dreams and the drive that you have? And then the work that you're doing within an institution that sort of, you know, empowers that and, and sort of drives that even further forward. Can I answer that? <laughs> so I, I'm not employed right now. I'm looking for a job in a museum and I do feel that I have a hard time finding a place here in Lisbon because it's where I, I'm looking for that actually reflect, like I feel myself compromising and compromising and compromise so I can actually apply for more uh, because if I do look for a place <laughs> with all the values that I hold it will be like it will cut it will cut the process <laughs> so I do feel what you mean and it's exactly the right words to put this frustration <laughs> that I have been feeling inside and I'll take this chance to uh, say thank you to Maria to assess Cultura for bringing these conversations because as a student of cultural management I got here because my um, public politics uh, teacher <laughs> recommended it I'm I'm loving that 
to see these conversations happen here. Uh, just a few weeks ago, I assisted a um, session on for, by Gulbenkian too about education in museums. So I do feel that again, the change is definitely starting to happen here too, but it's so slow. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it always? <laughs> How can we keep going when we feel, yeah, I think Mike also said he's a bit frustrated. Sometimes the rhythm is not exactly what he would like to be. How can we keep our spirits up? Uh, because yes, change is slow, especially when we discuss big organizations, it is slow, but things are happening, aren't they? What, what, what can keep us going? And I would also like to say if somebody does not feel comfortable to make a comment or ask a question in English, please write it on the chat and we can translate it. Don't feel like the language barrier. Yeah. yeah Maria, if I, oh, sorry. Susanna, yes. And then I think, yeah. if, I, if I may jump in. Yeah, well, I ask myself that question, you know, how do I keep my spirits up? And I must say that uh, Emily and Mike, you've been quite inspiring. I was actually in that uh, summer school that Marta mentioned, and I, I, I used both of you as part of my um, participation in the summer school because I'm feeling that I, I now have to rely myself on people that have a positive uh, vision of what change can be, not only change by change, but change based in core values like love and respect and trust. And uh, I must say that this is, it has been a struggle for me these last few years because of uh, all the contradictions among the museum world, you know, the way we take care or don't take care of our people, you know, inside our staff, our, the artists, the mediators, all the people that make the museum alive and uh, gives, um, you know, helps it to fulfilling its mission but also care for, for everybody else, you know, how we place ourselves in the world. So it has been a struggle for me, but it has been an opportunity to read a lot about another way of looking of, uh, to what I do every day. I'm, I'm head of education. And uh, so one of the ways to keep my spirits up is be surrounded by people that truly believe in change based in core values that are respectful, and, um, you know, that take care of the, the world around us and that sees us as part of it. I, I must say that one of the sentences that I carry with me since that day when I had speech was something that I took from you, Mike, that said that museum is not it, but us, you know. And uh, mm -hmm. I think a lot about that because when you put yourself in this us, then things have to be different because you're part of it. So it's also your responsibility. Um, well. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Susanna. Anyone else? Sarah, I think you were ready to say something and we cut you. And Enrique also, yes, sorry. Enrique, you? Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll start. Yeah. And I then Sarah, yeah. I have, uh, well, actually, generally I don't work in museums. I work, sometimes I work for museums. I'm, I'm basically an artist. But I've also worked, you know, in several periods in museums. I think actually the biggest problems and is that, and I'm tempted to say it's not only here, the museum is, is thought as an archive, as a place to keep works of art. And all the rest almost become secondary to it. So the people, even the, even the audiences, they're meant to go there, not necessarily to enjoy, but to be educated. So there's, I think there's a very strong power uh, in balance and uh, how to change this I have no idea I think it's uh, it's it's deeply rooted in culture in, uh, in capitalism also the idea that the museum has to somehow generate money or generate value which has to be codified in money I do think there's changes happening but I think the shift is so extraordinary that I'm not, uh, I'm not sure it's, I don't know. I think it will need a kind of a revolution in thought, which I don't think it's coming. I think we're taking s steps, it's, uh, it's widening, but I think it's, there is a very, very, yeah, very deep change to happen that and I, I don't see it happening. Mm 
and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not being pessimistic, but I think it has to come some, from somewhere else. Thank you, Eric. Sarah? You meant me, Maria? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I thought you okay, were ready okay. to say something. Yeah, <laughs> because I turned. Well, um, I, it's so. Um, these questions are really difficult, but I think what we are doing now is already part um, of a big change, which means that we are thinking collectively, uh, bringing this collective intelligence into uh, an inspiring um, path uh, to what we can do next. Thinking is really important acting is really important as well. And um, changing institution is uh, extremely difficult, but um, outside we are already a force of change. And um, museum mediators, they have this um, extraordinary power to link to people. So when we start this change, even outside uh, the institution, it's already, forcing the institution to change. And there are in incredible movements uh, in our days of change starting from outside to the inside. And um, I just wanted to mention as well from this conference uh, last week, the summer school, uh, we were talking about um, other possibilities of being and Okay, uh, and, and there was this, uh, I think, very inspire, inspiring communication by Maria Kazu, uh, where she was pointing the um, three cephalic monsters of the institution, meaning that the institution is uh, um, separating collection and, and um, the education and curating, thinking um, th these things separately when they need to be together. So um, uh, in, in, in when we were writing the Porto Santo Charter, we coined uh, a new a word that I think uh, means uh, a lot to all that I'm saying and that we are discussing here, which is um, uh, th that the institutions need to be institutions, meaning that they need to change from within and connect to the outside more. Um, like like uh, we were talking of thinking about uh, the institution, uh, institution being us and not a need, or this uh, beautiful idea that Maria was saying about um, the outreach, meaning that community is out. So that's Mike's idea. <laughs> it's brilliant. It's really a way. So just just naming, just using new words like institutions or in reach. I don't know. Just uh, it makes us uh, think differently, and and I really feel a lot of uh, power in this community that is uh, here uh, reunited. For me, it inspires me a lot. And I feel uh, um, I do the change that I want to bring to the world. Uh, and this is a bit my motto too. And I, 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 I'm, I'm very sure that a lot of, uh, of you think uh, likewise. Thank you, Sarah. Anyone else? To, yes, I'm Mike. I'm posting a few resources in the um, chat, so don't get distracted by that. But I wanted to share a few different things that have been uh, just helpful and influential for me. Um, and then, yeah, just a quick thank you to Sarah for, um, yeah, what you're talking about connects so strongly to this idea of building a community of change and a co it's collective work. Um, and when I'm in a, with a group like this and we're all frustrated, it's like, well, but there's, we're all, we're all like connect. And <laughs> there's more of us that couldn't, you know, make it to this conversation, obviously. So I think um, going across some of these barriers of departments and silos and, you know, geographic space to connect with people. Um, I'm often surprised and really hopeful and optimistic when, you know, I can connect with a large group of people and everyone is kind of thinking, you know, how do we make this change happen? And it's like, all right, well, there's a big we, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just to echo that, I mean, I think that when, I think it can be very hard uh, working within institutions and you feel like you sometimes are Kind of battling away and and I, I definitely feel that one way of keeping going is to step outside and and join conversations like this they're so enriching and and so inspiring and encouraging it's a like 
you, it, it's it's a kind of vital kind of nourishment, I think, that we 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 all need. That, that was really good, Emily, to remind us of this. Yes, thank you. Anyone else that would like to intervene, say something, share a thought? Otherwise, this last thought from Emily is really good. It's actually what I'm trying to do many times. This is what saved me intellectually and physically many times is that, yes, you step out and you get into conversations with other colleagues and you get your spirits up and you refocus or you see things in a different perspective and then you can keep you can keep going. Yes. Can I just add something that I yes, think Helen. is really, really inspiring in this talk about love and institutions and what we do? It's, it, I mean, I never thought about it. I didn't read this article, but when we think about love and relationships and, and the way we relate to the people we love, to the things we love and trust, if we really bring this to our um, jobs, uh, to the, our professional life, this is already a big change. You make um, um, a relationship from the institution to all the partners that you work with as a constellation of friends and not colleagues. I don't know. I'm just bringing mm -hmm. these to my world. And I, 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 I love you for bringing this idea <laughs> because it's brilliant. It, it really changes us a lot. And we shouldn't yeah. be afraid of uh, speaking about love. It's really the world we need. Thank the you. Word we need. Yes. Uh, Maria. Yes, Emily. Just to flag, there was a really interesting question in the chat from Pietra about... Yeah, I would like to um, say that I cannot see the chat or anything else. It's all blocked on my screen. So okay, please, so, yes, just... So this really interesting yes. question about how we... Um, we talk about how difficult it is to work these... Uh, to have these values working within an institution. What about working them with the communities that are sometimes so polarized how can we work love and common values with so many different polarized opinions and I, yeah. I think it's a really good and very challenging question um to which i i have to say i don't have a i don't have an easy answer you know i don't have a quick answer to this but i really appreciate being asked it because i think it's it's it, it's getting me thinking about how much work we did as a division to try and um you know get to a point where we felt we had a common set of values and and how rarely we actually have those conversations or 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 think in that way with with the partners that we work with outside of the organization and and the extent to which we should build that into our practice um, and have a very kind of honest conversation around what are the values that you're bringing to this to this work and how do they align or not with with ours and um i just really appreciate being prompted to think about to think about that yeah thank you pietra so anyone else who really aches <laughs> to share something with us if not, I would really uh, like to thank again uh, Mike Moravsky and Emily Pringle for accepting our invitation to have this discussion with us today. It was very inspiring and it brought us hope and it brought us love and it brought us some focus as well, I think, I hope. Uh, this was the third uh, conversation in the series, The Activist Museum Going Deeper. We don't know which one will be the next. We're just looking around all the time. So if anybody has any wishes or uh, suggestions, please send them to us. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again in a conversation on another one of our initiatives. Thank you all so much. <laughs>